All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we are covering an article that Neil A. Maxwell wrote in the 1974 October issue of The Enzyme. This is prophetic. It is fabulous and is very applicable to our world, uh, our social justice world today. And I, I want to run through this. Uh, I want to thank Aaron, by the way, who's the one who sent this to me. He is a listener. Uh, I read this uh, last night, twice, highlighted it, um, thrilled with what, um, uh, what, what Neil A. Maxwell says in this. At the time, he is an assistant to the Quorum of the Twelve. He's not yet an apostle. I think that at the time, that was a general authority position. But uh, they, they've done away with that, with that calling since then. But let's go to this article here. And you're going to notice, obviously, at the time, the term social justice isn't used as much. And so he doesn't use that term. The, the thriving global uh, um, ideology of justice at the time is communism. And, and so you have here in, in mid-70s, this is uh, the Soviet Union is at its height um, interestingly, this is the same year, I believe, that um, the Gulag Archipelago is, is translated into English, right, from Solzhenitsyn, uh, talking about the, the, uh, the realities of what's happening with communism in the Soviet Union and the imprisonment and the torture and, and, and all of the problems that are not being let out and, and people in their minds that are still loving Marxism, right? They have this idea of utopia that very quickly after Solzhenitsyn's book comes out are disillusioned by things. A number of them start moving more into postmodernism. Yes, that rat roots from, from leftists as well uh, and, uh, and other things and trying to redefine things. And, and, but it's an interesting time. Um, you've got uh, everything going on in, in Maoist China with a cultural revolution. Uh, you have Pol Pot. You have uh, North Korea, right? This is a, a global issue uh, that, that's happening at the time uh, where the, the social justice of the time is, is communism. But Neil A. Maxwell does use certain words that we can identify with even today, such as equality. And, and a few others that we'll be able to go through here that I think you're going to find very interesting the way he seems to see things at his time um, that apply exactly the same then as they do now. So let's run through this. And I'm going to spend most of the time here, if you're on video, looking at the, uh, the, the talk here. Um, I, I think it's interesting that they start off here in the talk with um, focused on, you know, they usually put a little summary at the beginning, a phrase at the beginning. Um, let me move this down here. Assistant to the Council of the Twelve. Uh, Eternalism versus secularism, by the way. That's the name of the, of the article. Eternalism versus secularism. And this is a point that I'm going to hit pretty hard about secularism. Secularism sprouts out of academia more than anywhere else. Right, the religion of academia, ironically, is secularism. And what is the primary secular movement of academia? It's critical social justice. Right. So this this goes hand in hand with what he's talking about here, and he gets very specific on things that I find that I think you'll find is very interesting. So the summary of the article is: eternalism focuses on changing the individual. The individual. Right? That's savior theology. That's our behavior, changing our behavior, repenting, moving forward with the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what eternalism is about. Changing the individual by teaching him correct principles. Secularism tends to deal increasingly with adjustments outside men. And he'll go over this. Like what? Like systems. Like systemic. 
and and he covers this more precisely later later in the article. So real quickly, I'm just going to go over what I've highlighted here in this article. But uh, he gives a definition of eternalism defined as that view of man and the universe which not only acknowledges but exalts the in the existence of Heavenly Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, who have authored and implemented a redeeming plan for mankind. So the opposite end of this is going to be against the plan of salvation. Secularism, he says, is herein defined as that view of man and the universe, which is essentially irreligious with regard to the existence of God and cosmic purpose for man. So other things are going to fill in the void here. He goes on and says, but which is not necessarily irreverent with regard to man and his worth. Okay, now, Starting down here on the first thing that I highlight, it says, but there are significant differences involved in these two distinct approaches. Uh, Eternalism versus secularism. To the problems that confront man, right? There's two different approaches to the problems that confront man. How about racism, as an example? And these, or poverty, right? Where, Where communism has come in and wanting to destroy the classes and lift everybody up from the bottom, right? And these differences have serious implications for the individual. Um, The shortfall of secularism with its frequent failure to answer satisfactorily the long-range cost-effectiveness questions concerning what really benefits man, in fact, calls attention to itself. Errant to random do-goodism. Think about the words that he's using here. Errant to random do-goodism. Which, which you can you, you can quantify a little bit as as you know being motivated by compassion without perhaps reason has so often been sincere, but has ended up being ineffective or is reminiscent of straightening deck chairs on the Titanic. The wrong kind of help. This to me is critical race theory and social justice. The wrong kind of help isn't really helpful. It is often harmful, racist in itself, divisive. For solutions become problems. So oftentimes if we've got the wrong approach, we're using the wrong solution, that solution actually becomes the bigger problem than the issue it intends to help, to solve, right? Good motives and good ideas can produce laudable results, but sometimes such combinations can also produce the results now decried by almost all, such as we see, for instance, in our public welfare programs. Right? Okay. Secular efforts, for example, have tried over the centuries and in many ways to redistribute wealth. Now, we can look at what's happening today in in a little bit of a different mode of, of, of looking back. What he's focusing on primarily here, as you can look at, is, is socialism slash communism. And so he's focusing on the redistribution of wealth, trying to help out the poor and pulling from the rich, right? That, uh, that can be transferred to today with what we might call social credit and, and, and seeing the different marginalized groups or any demographic, any group that is found within any collective inside of intersectionality is, is, is going to be given a, a there, there's, there's a, a way, a Marxian way that we find in social justice that tries to even everything out. And that doesn't mean we don't want to even things out. We do want to even things out. But hard leftism, and Marxian tenets that try to do this become the bigger problem. So he says again, and that's, te- that's the secular movement of the left, of the hard left, is Marxian tenets. Everything in the radical hard left uh, uh, movement that we find ourselves drowning in today is rooted in a Marxian tenet or several Marxian tenets. That doesn't mean they don't push back on some of those things. A lot of times you'll hear that there's pushback and they don't really follow Marxism. If you listen to anyone or read anyone who has produced things about critical race theory or social justice or or the, lar- the biggest pundits such as Ibram Kendi 
and and uh, the founders of, of critical race theory, Richard Delgado and John, Jean, Jean Stefanczyk and, and Kimberly Crenshaw, they all support these Marxian tenets. They all want to rip down liberal democracy, all of them. It's not my words. It's not a conspiracy. It's not a bogeyman, right? It, it is their own words where they say this. But we can look at redistribution of wealth the same way that the communists look at it. The Marxists look at redistribution of wealth. We can see the same thing in the redistribution of social credit. It is the judgment of some, some historians, he says, that human systems of redistribution are temporary. For after a short period of time, wealth is once again back into the hands of the few. Why? It's because of meritocracy. It's not all oppression. He is decrying the system, systems of redistribution here. Human systems do not seem to be able to deal very effectively with the challenge of poverty. Either for that, ma- either for that matter. Eternalism, and this is what we need to be focused on, not on social justice and, and critical race theory. Eternalism focuses on values and behavior which where followed, result in either enlightened use of wealth or social credit or, or, or relationships between races and different demographics and marginalized and non-marginalized and etc. The individual truly feels he is the concerned custodian of wealth in behalf of others and so behaves, right? So in other words, you can't have meritocracy sitting on its own. That's kind of the crux of libertarianism you have to have charity you have to have both and when there is more of a lack of charity then meritocracy falls on its face right you can't do that you have to have both and freedom falls on its face quite frankly because it's only for a select few you have to have both or in those remarkable but few episodes like the city of enoch the small branches of middle east christians in the apostolic era era and the brief but happy period, AD 36 to 201, on the American hemisphere from the Book of Mormon, where the lines between rich and poor were dissolved by the warmth and righteousness of practicing Christians. Charity. Right? You have to have charity. Meritocracy, goodness, eternalism, charity are what need to fight against problems of racism and disparity and oppression, etc. Not secularism. Critical social justice is as secular as you can get. It spawns out of academia. He goes on and says, secularism has yet to bring about such parallel circumstances in spite of the many utopias attempted. So many youth today have not been taught what has happened in the 20th century. They'll hear about Nazism and the horrors there. But many of them, even in well into their 20s, don't know anything about the Bolshevik Revolution. They don't know anything about the gulags. They don't know anything about Stalinism, Pol Pot, uh, uh, Castro, you know, the horrors of North Korea and, and <laughs> the Maoist Cultural Revolution. They don't hear about that, where, where you had six million Jews die in, in horror in, with, with, with Nazi Germany in charge, with the utopia, the other, right, that was a German Aryan utopia, with the utopia of the leftists, you had over a hundred million people die and countless more imprisoned, starving, tortured, uh, put into poverty, just just absolute horrors that has changed many of those countries that they, they, they still haven't been able to recover from. The utopia that is desired today does not have a basis to it of how it's going to actually be there other than we're going to topple liberal democracy. We're going to get justice where it is needed. We're going to break down the oppressors. But there's no, there, there's nothing in place of that that works. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no solution that's actually there. It is secularism. 
Neil A. Maxwell goes on and says, the new secular moral geometry, as he calls it, with its fluid lines, alien angles, and restless points, he has such a way with words, always did, rejects the idea of divine design in the universe, but then naively seeks to muster righteous indignation, justice, in behalf of the disadvantaged, but without any corresponding concern over the need for non-economic morality or non-demographic uh, morality today, the very values necessary to make indignation righteous. It pulls you away from righteousness. It pulls you away from a doctrine of Christ and, and the plan of salvation. He goes on and says, while there are often, as between eternalism and secularism, shared concerns, right? So you can say eternalism and the gospel of Jesus Christ being concerned about race relations, as an example, right? And, and it, as it's a big topic right now. And, and you have a, a, a concern that most have that adopt social justice about racism, right? Even though they don't always know the underlying vehicle that's actually carrying them. Um, there is also a very sharp divergence, he says, in terms of the solutions proposed. So again, I, this, this is, uh, you know, as we've gone over things that you've heard from the BYU professors, as you hear members of the church and others try and, try and conflate a hard leftist um, secular solution to rooting out racism, the charge of the prophet that, that he's given us. Understand the difference here. As he's going over primarily economic issues that, that communism was focused on and socialism were focused on. The difference today is that it's done with the demographics of collectives of individuals or of, of, of collectives of race and, and sexual uh, orientation or of gender uh, identity or ableism and, and, and many other intersectional collectives. There is a sharp divergence. Please understand that between eternalism, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and a secular approach like critical race theory and intersectionality. They can't work together. They are divergent completely. There are some shared concerns, but in the end, when you get to the core of each of those, they are driven by different motives and they are driven to uh, different ends. Here's another one that goes exactly against what you see in critical social justice today. He says, eternalism places a high value on work per se. Work, right? Meritocracy, hard work. You will see, for example, in the uh, Smithsonian whiteness chart, you may have seen in a couple of the episodes that I've put out there or seen elsewhere, uh, one of the, one of the, the tenets as is taught by professors of whiteness is that in whiteness, hard work and, and a work ethic is a value, right? As if that's a horrible thing. Well, here Neil A. Maxwell says that eternalism, the gospel of Jesus Christ, places a high value on work and therefore on meritocracy. That is the exact opposite of what you're taught about whiteness and about critical social justice. It's exactly the opposite of what Ibram Kendi teaches. Neil A. Maxwell says it is a spiritual necessity for man in regards to work. A spiritual necessity for man. This is antithetical to critical social justice. Just ask Ibram Kendi. Just ask, just ask any professor of whiteness or uh, colonialism, post-colonialism. He says, secularism often finds itself trying to reduce the necessity for work without showing corresponding concern as to the purposes to which leisure time should be put. Expect more idleness or pleasure seeking. Right? So a secular approach is going to reduce an emphasis on work 
on the individual being productive. Find how much focus there is on an individual being productive outside of looking ever under every nook and cranny and stone out there for racism. Try and find that in critical social justice. You will find it over and over again where, where this is a whiteness uh, uh, um, value. It's, it's such a horrific way to look at things. And, and by the way, whenever you see whiteness, Again, what you, what you hear, these are words that are pregnant with connotation and meaning, right? Whiteness essentially means Western liberal democracy. That's really what it means. Colonialism. That's what they're talking about. And so when you see whiteness, which it's, it's not just a racial thing. Just like critical race theory isn't just a racial thing. It's not. It's about something much bigger. It's about something underlying this that is that has much more to do with a form of government, with a utopian, a utopian vision, and, and with the, the breaking down, the, which is what critical really means in critical race theory and critical theory, which is the breaking down of liberal democracy which includes also in a Western civilization, right? It's the, it's the breakdown of Western civilization, which also includes Christianity. It also includes reason. It also includes religion as a whole. It also includes, very specifically, if you read the actual writings of those that push, are, are, are the real movers and shakers of social justice and, and critical race theory, it also includes the breakdown of the family, Yes, that's what they want. He goes on and says, eternalism focuses on the individual and on the processes in which the individual is taught correct principles and then is given optimum opportunity, right? It's like the, uh, one of my favorite quotes is from President Oaks, right? Where he says, I'm going to paraphrase, The equality of God is the equality of opportunity, not the equality of results, which today is really what equity means. The equality of results. When you hear equity, it usually means equality of results, and that's what CRT is focused on. And any way to get there, by force, tyranny, authoritarianism, uh, policy, whatever, it's not about opportunity. And you'll see that in the policies and in the teachings and in the movement of of critical social justice and critical race theory. So the individual is given optimum opportunity to govern himself, not to have more rules out there trying to govern him. Indeed, he says, nowhere does this contrast appear to be more stark between the basic approaches to man's problems, again, like race and every other issue that's coming up, than in the focus of eternalism on the individual as the basic human reality. And then he puts, and next, the family. So think about critical social justice and intersectionality and, and, and see how what it wants to do is place you in a collective. It is removing your individuality. It is removing family. It loves to remove family. It fights against family. You'll see this in education, where they're trying to divide parents from their kids. It's a natural thing to happen. You'll see this in, uh, you'll see this in the teachings and, and in the, the books and papers that are produced by critical race theorists and, and those that focus on critical social justice. They don't hide it. This is not a right-wing conspiracy. I, I am, I'm not really on the right wing. Right? It, it, this is, this is, that's not what this is. They say it themselves. Go to the source. And so when, when Neil A. Maxwell brings this up about the individual and then the family, that is the exact opposite of what a secular mo- uh, movement does. And that's exactly what critical social justice is. He says, where reform and desirable change are concerned, eternalism opts 
for conditions that facilitate true individual growth. Letting the consequences of... This is... This is can you imagine listening in, to a professor at BYU or any university that's really pushing critical race theory and critical social justice and whiteness and colonialism and post-colonialism? Can you imagine them focusing in on facilitating true individual growth? No. See, the problem is out there. That is what critical social justice wants to teach you. The problem is always out there. It's not with you. You don't need to worry about repentance. You don't need to worry about changing. You don't need to worry about growth. It's the oppressors that we have to go after. That's exactly what liberation theology teaches, which is the critical social justice in Christianity that is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ and a savior theology that teaches that it's about you and your growth and becoming who you are becoming. They don't give a rip about who you're becoming because there's no eternal perspective. The problem for them is always out there. He goes on and says, so eternal law, so eternalism, he says, opts for conditions that facilitate true individual growth, letting the consequences of any successes ripple outward. That is what you see in poverty today around the globe with, with capitalism and liberal democracy. We have never seen, we, we have had 50% reduction. I, I don't know if I got this number right. I'll, I'll follow up and put it in the description in the YouTube uh, once I find it. But I believe we've had a 50% reduction in poverty just in the last, I want to say 15 to 20 years. Globally, that is thanks to trade and to, and to liberal democracy and capitalism. He says, secularism tends to want to deal increasingly with systems. There it is, right? Secularism tends to want to deal increasingly with systems, governments, labels, groups, etc., with adjustments in the things outside man, outside the individual, apparently hoping that somehow changing the external scenery will change the things inside man. What, what, they're beautiful words. This is, this is so spot on. He knows exactly what he's saying. And remember what his context is back then. It's socialism and communism. Why is he saying the exact same things that go against critical social justice here without having as much that movement at the time? Because it's the same thing. It's a secular movement founded in Marxian tenets. Just one more time, I want to read that again. Secularism tends to want to deal increasingly with systems like systemic racism, governments, labels, groups, with adjustments in the things outside man, apparently hoping that somehow changing the external scenery will change the things inside man. That is, that is so profound. And he goes back and makes kind of a charge to the individual here. He says, for those of us who see the human condition as one in which there is more stupidity than cupidity, more apathy than conspiracy. There is no real place to begin but within our, but with ourselves. That's the opposite of critical race theory and what it teaches you. Everything that it teaches you to do as an individual is for the benefit of, of a collective and for changing things externally, not changing yourself. And then, and then this is great. This is... This is exactly what's happening. I wish I could go back to 1974 and talk to him at this moment and, and get his thoughts as he put this, this article together. He says, Eternalism lays great stress on the innocence of the newborn and on the importance of helping that individual streamlet as its source to have identity, belonging, and purity as it rolls forward in life. Of course, that is an identity as a child of God, belonging to a family, to the church. However, 
or, or, or secularism, however, becomes fascinated with the need for vast purification plants. You're never pure enough. For vast purification plants downstream designed to purge the individual and to reprogram him. That is the indoctrination of hard leftist tenets. That is the indoctrination of the religion of academia. And that is exactly what education tends to do, right? What, what critical pedagogy, which is what we're fine if you've seen any of these BYU episodes, that's exactly what critical pedagogy is. It's how we teach and how we're going to teach a critical theory based type of education, which is all about indoctrination and activation and, and a reprogramming of how you behave and who you think you are. So it's, it's been very successful in the academy, in, in, in universities in the U.S., and now it's moving further and further into K-12. And you can see the pushback from it. That's why they are trying to divide parents from the kids. They don't want the parents to have a say. They want their critical pedagogy that they have more free reign in in the universities to be able to brought, be brought down earlier to the kids in K-12. to now, you'll see this more and more. We'll, we'll follow this. We can see this in, 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 in what's happening in Canada right now, right? And, and, and what is in this smaller way happening in the U.S. where you have this move toward, again, in education where parents are at uh, uh, school board meetings not happy with what is being taught. And the largest organization and labor union in the country for the, the, for the teachers union goes to the FBI or, or the Department of Justice, it says, hey, we want you to label these parents as domestic terrorists, right? This is authoritarianism. And this is where things end up going. This is, you see today uh, in, in Canada, the, the freezing of the accounts of the truckers, and this could be for the left or the right, I don't care. What I care about is, is, is the principle and the issue, right? But this example is on the right also, right? It's, it's, where, it's where the truckers had their, a lot of their accounts frozen, uh, the crowdfunding on, on GoFundMe and other uh, crowdfunding applications have been monitored and, and told by the Canadian government to seize those funds. Um, today, Trudeau came out and it, we find out that, that he is trying to make that permanent in Canada, that they will have complete... Uh, government control of these funding mechanisms online. And of course, what's the next step with something like that? The next step is the credit cards, right? Again, it's all about social credit. If you don't do the right things and you can be deemed a problem, right? Then, then you can't use PayPal. You can't use the credit cards. There are going to be a uh, reduction of, 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 of rights and benefits and privileges in working with a bank. That's where this heads. And here, Neil A. Maxwell tells us, if we are not able to build into ourselves and our families the breaks of self-restraint and self-discipline, we are apt, unwittingly, to create tyranny in our government or anarchy in our citizenry. If we push onto the government the management not only of our economy, but also the management of our morals, we see this being pushed off to to Hollywood. We see this being pushed off to education. We see this being pushed off to large businesses. The morals are all being residing, for example, in businesses in the HR department, right? And, and then, of course, on a grander scale to the government. If we push onto the government, the management not only of our economy, but also the management of our morals, the civil servants of the future will be neither civil nor servants. Now, this part here, I would, I would for, for those of you that are, and I know you're good people, but have fallen into um, the, the thought process of thinking that critical race theory and critical social justice is the way to go, I'd like you to pay specific attention to this paragraph here. Usually, secularism does not err deliberately. Nor can there be a denial about the need for the expertise or concern 
that are often brought to bear by sincere secularists. It's not saying that you're a secularist, but but you may be adopting a secularism, a, a secularist movement and ideology. But the caveat, and then in quotation marks, the wisdom of the wisdom of man is foolishness, includes not just man's faulty tactical logic, but his tendency to proceed from erroneous, basic, and strategic assumptions. And that's the problem with critical social justice. It, its assumptions are erroneous. Having erred tragically, he says, with regard to those assumptions, it should be no surprise that conceptual cul-de-sacs are encountered so frequently by the well-intentioned. Being learned is not always the same as being wise. In opposition to this, he says, eternalism looks at long-range outcomes as well as temporary needs. It places great emphasis on the shaping influences at the front end of life, on love, correct principles, wise discipline, and on a nutritive home atmosphere. Good homes are still the best source of good humans. You may not know this, and I've brought this up already in this episode, but those that push hardest and, and are the authors of this critical social justice movement and critical race theory, they fight against the family. They fight against the home. That is not some interpretation. Those are their own words. Please keep that in mind. And then Neil A. Maxwell comes back and focuses in on the teachings of the Savior and on his atoning sacrifice. And he quotes scripture here. He says, for he is more intelligent than they all, right? That's from the book of Abraham. He says, Jesus is not only the very best, he is the very brightest. And those who follow him have abundant assurance about the shepherd who is leading them. And he gives the example of Peter when they're saying, well, you know, are you going to leave also? This was after uh, one of the incidents of the of the bread and 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 the uh, and and and, and the, the 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 loaves of bread and, and the fish, I believe. And he says, you know, when Jesus inquires of him, will ye also go away? And Peter's reply, he says, reflected one of the realities of the universe, and that is, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The solution to the problems of mankind, to social justice, to oppression, to all these things, is the Savior. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not going to be found in a secular movement like critical race theory and critical social justice. These these are movements of man with, with the principles of secularism and the faultiness and foolishness of man in their assumptions behind these movements. And they include, quite frankly, a lot of motives that are not righteous, that are not good. Just a few more nuggets here from uh, Neil A. Maxwell. He quotes Samuel Callan, who warned, The church that weds itself to the culture of the day will be a widow within each succeeding age. If the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'm not talking about the brethren, I'm not talking about that level, right? I'm talking about the bureaucracy. I'm talking about the membership. If the church weds itself to the culture of the day, which is predominantly and increasingly becoming uh, driven by Ibram Kendi's anti-racism and, and critical social justice intersectionality and, and the religion of academia, we will be a widow within each succeeding age. We need to be very careful about what we deem as being a, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ as compared to a secular movement. He also goes in and says, indeed, secularism seems to be saying not, I think, therefore I am, but I feel, therefore I am. If you are tying yourself to critical social justice, to Ibram Kendi's anti-racism, are you moving just based off of a reactionary feeling? Are, are you being manipulated with, compa- with your compassion? 
but it, but it is not the highest value. And, and that's what critical social justice wants us to imagine, right? It wants us to believe that compassion is the highest value because then it can pull you in like a moth to the flame. And it, and it says, look, there is nothing higher than this, but there is, there is truth. Truth is higher than this. And there are ways to, to express and to manifest your compassion that are not couched in hard leftist tenets and, and, and ideologies. And I would say the same thing when it comes, because it's coming, when, it, when, when those things are couched in hard right tenets and, and uh, ideologies. I say it's coming. Why do I say that? Because there's going to be a reaction to all of this. We are just at the tip of the iceberg with critical social justice. And as it infiltrates more and more and more through the institutions and takes control of the institutions and, and somewhat at least of government, and much of Christianity, by the way, there's going to be a, a reaction. Right now, there's a reaction from the right. But, but there, there's, in, there's going to be some elements that are going to be hard right that are not going to be pretty reactions to this. Because how do I know that? Because that's the way it always is. It's the way it always works. Then he gives us a, another great point here. He says, only occasionally does secularism attempt to project the human consequences of its policies and programs. Right? So calling out and saying we want justice from and pulling down the oppressors and, and we want justice, they're very rarely over gonna, ever going to go over what the consequences of all of this are. They don't care what the consequences are, quite frankly. Because that's not what they talk about. What is this going to mean? How is this going to look? What about these policies and programs that are going to, go, going to put into, be put into place? What are the consequences of all of this? They don't talk about that very often. He says, those who do not look at root causes. It's very important in understanding a lot of what should be done in, with, with man's problems today. Those who do not look at root causes usually fail to look at ultimate consequences. And then just as I discussed about taking that one principle, a true principle like compassion, and elevating it in your values hierarchy above all other things, this is what he says. He says, secularism often seizes upon a single true principle like compassion or justice and elevates it above its pure principles. See, the problem is it's always this way. This is the way the adversary always works. He brings in something good with something bad. So you can have good things. There's good, better, and best, right? Well, compassion is a good thing if it's used properly. But when it's elevated to the highest principle there is, and everything else that is good is done away with or drifts way downstream from that one single elevated principle, you're going to have major, major problems, right? Again, what's the first commandment? It's to love God, right? With all your heart, might, mind, and strength, right? And the second is to love others. He says, this act of isolation with that value does not make the principle seized any less true, right? Compassion and justice are, are important. But it strips that principle of its supporting principles. One can be incarcerated within the prison of one principle, justice, compassion. It is, it is, this, is, this is so telling and, 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 and so spot on to what we live through today. It just, just like what he was talking about from the problems of socialism and, and communism back in the day. And then for those that try to talk a lot about peace today and, and peace is the higher value, he does the same thing with the value of peace. He says, for instance, peacemakers are precious commodities. They are. But peacemaking must be tied to other principles or it can easily become peacemaking at any price, right? Or justice at any price. That's the way critical social justice works. And then we get one of our words here in equality as we wrap this up. 
he quotes Charles Frank Frankel, who he says observed of those who, who would currently subordinate everything else to equality. Your DEI, right? Your diversity equity, which is what he's talking about here, and inclusion. Your, your whole idea of equality, which is really a, an idea of justice. It's the same idea. The quote is this from Charles Frankel. Frankel, the fallacies of the new egalitarianism. Well, we have a new egalitarianism today. Come largely from having ripped the notion of equality loose from its context. The result is to turn it into a principle vagrant and homeless and identifiable in fact only if a quasi-theological context is unconsciously imported. Neil A. Maxwell says of this, elevating any correct principle to the plane of religion, the religion of academia, is poor policy. Just as one person makes a poor church, one principle makes a poor religion. So having read this a couple times, I found it so spot on in, in how it relates to us today and how it relates with critical race theory and, and critical social justice that that are, again, it's the tip of the iceberg, what we're seeing right now. This, this is not turning around anytime fast. It's just the opposite. It is just becoming more and more emboldened right now. And we're going to see it more and more in the church. But these words from Neil A. Maxwell back in 1974 are applicable to us today because the same problems of socialism and communism, hard radical leftism, which is where critical race theory and and uh, critical social justice are, are come out of. That's what they are. These are the radicals of the 60s and 70s. That's who started all this. That's who wrote about this. That's who organized all of this. Um, he can talk about this and make it sound exactly like it's applicable today because it is the same problem. Egalitarianism, equality, secularism. These are the same exact issues. This is not anything new. It's just, it's built in, it's, it's, it's a vehicle with a different body and the same motor and chassis. And we look at the new body and the new model, and we say, ooh, this is appealing. This is great. This doesn't look like anything from the past. And by the way, I wasn't taught much about the past. But the direction that this is going, the chassis that carries this, is radical leftism with Marxian tenets, that it, that it is very proud, very proud to hold up as, as a banner or a bumper sticker on that vehicle. I would recommend that you go back and read this article. This is, I only covered a few of the points here. It's a longer article, but it is, it's fabulous. And it's something that you can anchor yourself on and use as a reference going for, forward to help you decipher these problems and these political and cultural changes that we are currently going through.